In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. O Lord, Creator, Savior, and Sanctifier, first we thank you for the blessing of good health, which brings us together this day from across our nation. We pray for family, friends, and all, that this blessing embrace and blanket your world. On this gathering of board members, members, and guests, we beseech you for your light into our hearts, minds, and souls as we continue the work to which you have called us to be responsive children, sons, and daughters. Unless we walk in your light, we cannot proceed forward to the task to which we have dedicated 33 years of service to our brethren, bearing witness to the gift of present knowledge of your truth and eternal existence when all things will be renewed in the Christ. We know, beloved and loving Father, that as laity, laus to theu, that it is from among us that our spiritual fathers come. Thus we pray for them in the task which they have embraced for and with us, gracious shepherds and flock. We confess, O oh, gracious Jesus Christ, our guide and staff in this age and into the age to come, that by your grace we respond to your teachings and through yours to the apostles and holy fathers through the ages. We implore you, O heavenly comforter, spirit of truth, that our deliberations this day, the feast of our great holy father John the Golden Mouth, be guided and illumined through the magnifying glass of your wisdom. We reach out to your gracious mother of our Lord and God Jesus Christ, that you will be with us this day and always as our mother who intercedes for us, each individually and all together. For it is known that the intercessions of a mother before her son are heard and our work is for and in his name, as our title, title states, we are loving children walking in his light as true believers serving our gathering in this nation, the church those called out to bear witness. Prosper the work of our hands, O Lord. Grant to the board of the Orthodox Christian laity wisdom, patience, and illumination. Bestow on our hierarchs and clergy peace of mind and heart to be open to your illumination so that together we all may come to the bliss of the promised life to come. Our glory to you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God through the ages. Amen. My beloved sisters and brothers in Christ, I thank you for the opportunity to be with you virtually through the marvel of technology and congratulate the members of the Orthodox Christian Laity and their new executive director, David Oansia, on the occasion of your 33rd annual meeting. Your zeal for the unity of the church and for ministries that serve the faithful is admirable and as a lay organization, you provide an opportunity for like-minded Orthodox Christians to convene and dialogue from all the various jurisdictional presences in America. Dialogue is never superfluous and is always useful. I fondly remember our dialogue when you came to New York shortly after my enthronement. As the church moves forward, and particularly as the Holy Archdiocese of America will observe its centennial in the coming year, I look forward to your proposals and considerations. We are in changing times a season of readjustment made even more difficult by the pandemic. But one thing never changes, and this one thing is the everlasting gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear Christians, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. May the Lord bless your deliberations and keep you in his love keep you in his righteousness and in the faith of our holy orthodox church 
through the prayers of your heavenly patrons, Holy Simeon, the new theologian, and the glorious and illumined Fortini, together with the Theotokos and all the saints. Amen. Are we ready? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm not sure where we, we hit the bump in the road. But anyway, I'm substituting for Father Michael Alexa. That's a pretty hard uh, thing to do. He's one of the finest storytellers I've ever heard in my life. He is the sort of walking encyclopedia on all matters dealing with particularly Alaska and American saints. So our time constraints mean I have to move very fast today. So we're just going to kind of skim through a lot of these, particularly with the focus on their impact of the main theme, which is uh, the foundation that they've given us to draw all Orthodox Christians into unity here in North America. So um, can you all see me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm going to hold up a couple of books because in addition to all those other things I do, I sell books. So if you'd like a deeper drink of what you're hearing today, I'm going to recommend three books. Uh, one of them is this one, uh, Orthodox Alaska Theology of Mission, Father Michael Alexa. It's right. an SBS Press publication. Father There's Chad, all... your video, I guess, is not running for your face. Yes. There you oh. go. Now I see you. Uh, okay. So anyway, there's the first one, uh, Alaska Orthodox uh, a Theology of Mission, Father Michael Alexa. Those are the Athabascan uh, 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 tombs, uh, spirit houses, which uh, you find outside of Anchorage. Then this one, which is Alaskan Missionary uh, Spirituality, again, SVS Press publication. And then this one, which you may or may not know, it's a new book uh, published just this year which is by our academic dean, uh, Ayanut Alexandru Todoria, uh, which is The Time Has Come, which are the debates over autocephaly reflected in the SBS quarterly. I, I highly recommend this one. So you can see from the cover of this book and the first slide that you're looking at, um, that's, by the way, an image of St. Innocent uh, arriving in what was then New Archangel. It is today Sitka, Alaska, with the Clinkets uh, ferrying him to shore. That's really a magnificent painting that's uh, done by a professor at St. Tikhon's University in Moscow, and he's very generous with us to allow us to use it. So next slide. This, of course, is the arrival of the first missionaries uh, in Alaska. They arrived in Kodiak uh, in what was then called St. Paul Harbor. Uh, in 1794 on the 24th of September. Pretty stormy sea. You know, they've crossed the Bering Sea. So those of you that have seen uh, America's Deadliest Catch, you know, you recognize uh, that the Bering Sea is pretty turbulent. So the question is always asked, were these the first Orthodox who arrived here? And we also know about St. Augustine, Florida. Probably the first Orthodox Christians to arrive in North America were frontiersmen. They were guys who came across that Bering Sea often in really flimsy kinds of boats, wood frames maybe with uh, seal skins stretched across them, uh, designed to move kind of cork-like. Uh, about 80% of them didn't even make it. They drowned in the stormy seas. But those guys uh, crossed because they were searching especially for sea otter pelts uh, the Chinese were paying top ruble for those pelts. But many of those men decided um, that they would not return to Russia. They fell in love with the land. They fell in love with the local women. They had children. They baptized their own children. They brought with them icons uh, and taught uh, their native Alaskan native wives to say the prayers. And they simply awaited until such time as actual missionaries came. I think what's important for us to recognize as American Orthodox Christians is these missionaries arrived on the West Coast. That makes us the only Christian tradition in America where um, our tradition arrived on the West Coast, not the East Coast. And they came actually as designated missionaries. There was a kind of a, well, a scoundrel actually named Grigory Shilikov. Um, 
He was uh, head of the uh, Russian American company. He had written a lot of, you know, self-promoting, flattering letters to the Tsarina about how many uh, new subjects she would have and the wealth and riches that uh, she would, she'll be having a share in from Alaska. And he requested missionaries to come. Uh, well, she denied it for a long time, but eventually she actually chose these missionaries, um, eight of them coming from uh, Valam Monastery. Now, Valam Monastery, you've got to pull up in your head your sixth grade geography here. Valam Monastery is right on the edge of the modern day Russian Finnish border. And that also means that this is the longest missionary journey ever undertaken by foot to this day. Those monks were known for their missionary ability and their zeal and their interest. That's why they were chosen from Valam. So they actually walked from there to St. Petersburg. Now I'm gonna pause for a little bit to give you a little entertaining story, I hope. One of the things that we know from the record they were given in St. Petersburg is a hand painted icon of the mother of God. And that icon, we can't identify it by 100%. But we know uh, from an iconographer who was actually working at St. Herman's in my day there uh, in um, uh, the early, early part of this century, that that particular painting, which we really did kind of rediscover on Spruce Island, it was totally black, wrapped and wrapped and wrapped in what my parents would have called bisqueen. He brought it back to the seminary where we had an icon studio set up and he cleaned it. But I have to tell you this part of the story. We were unsure about this icon because as I said, it was totally black. And we had a zero alcohol uh, policy at the seminary because we all know Alaska has an incredible problem with alcoholism and addiction. So one of my students came up and said that Victor needed vodka. And I thought, oh Lord have mercy, Victor's gone on a toot or something downstairs. So I actually went down uh, and he's, he says, no, no, Father, he says, I need the vodka to clean the icon. And he was showing me like golden uh, embossed cuffs and other things. So he had a formula that was protein, egg white and vodka. Uh, he didn't want to use modern chemicals on cleaning this very black icon. The icon came through beautifully. He was able to identify the school as the school that was the right time frame for St. Petersburg. It's in now the cathedral in Kodiak. Again, we don't have a certificate to say this is the icon, but we probably can 99% can understand that this icon is the very icon that St. Herman placed on the beach at Monk's Lagoon when the tsunami was headed towards Spruce Island. And one of his accounted miracles is he said that the tsunami would not rise above that mark. Okay, so the arrival of these missionaries, of course, was a disaster in many ways for them because all of the promises that Shilikov had made were lies. But despite the abuse of the native Alaskan peoples, they were so anxious to receive baptism. And one of the reasons why is in every single Alaskan native tribal group, whether it's the Clinkets in the Southeast and the Huna in the Southeast, the Yupik Eskimos in the central part, the Unangan Aleuts out on the chain, whichever group, the Aleutics on K Kodiak Island, they all had the same story in their own religious expression. And that was that their religion was not complete and that their religion would be completed by men that would come from across the sea. They would recognize them by two factors, their great beards and the crosses. Uh, maybe the crosses were this mass on the ship, whatever it happens to be. But all of, all of the native groups were very anxious to welcome these missionaries because they saw them as the fulfillment of their own tribal prophecies. The priests became the advocates for the natives and they were punished for that. To this day, Alaska looks to Orthodox clergy and leadership when there are issues where Alaska natives need their voice uh, as advocates. Next slide. Amongst the uh, best known of these missionaries was a lay monk, uh, St. Herman. Uh, we refer to him as uh, elder and wonder worker of Alaska. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of his glorification. 
uh, I can't deal too much because of the time constraints on, on so much of his life, but I can tell you this, that to this day, many, many Alaska natives will come into Kodiak and say, I need to go to Spruce Island and spend some time with Father Herman. Uh, he has made such a deep impact on the native Alaskan peoples uh, that when they're struggling with spiritual issues, that's what they want to do. They want to make that pilgrimage and be close to the place where St. Herman spent 39 years actually living in exile, taking care of Creole children, largely by himself with a little bit of other help. A little side note that I think is interesting. Uh, he was able to grow potatoes on a very rocky uh, island. And to this day in Alaskan agriculture, that's noted. He, did, he developed a process of growing the potatoes under seaweed blankets so he could actually sort of noodle them, harvest them, uh, and feed the children. There was a type of Russian pea uh, that he brought with him that also flourished there until the Second World War when American soldiers came to the island and kind of tramped all of the peas down and no one was able to rescue the actual seed. But anyway, he was there. There are lots of stories of native Alaskans of him standing as the salmon are going upstream uh, for spawning where he would catch the salmon and toss it up so it had an easier trip uh, for spawning. Like many saints that we know from the Alaskan tradition, there's also a long understanding that even the Kodiak bears um, treated him with respect and were friendly with him. So as a lay monk, um, there are today a lot of letters that we keep finding uh, in archives, sometimes in people's personal possession, which show that he was writing back um, to St. Petersburg, uh, giving reports on the abuse of the people associated with the Russian American company of the native Alaskan peoples and all of their needs. What I always find striking about the life of Father Herman is he was not a complainer and a moaner, despite whatever the hardships were. And it's because he was so anchored in his own personal ascetical life. And that's a model for all of us. So I like to remind people that our own Orthodox heritage here has been through Father Herman, really grounded in the ascetical life. Um, he educated these Creole children uh, and many of them went on to be leaders in the church, leaders in the government, leaders in education. Uh, he left quite a legacy, which is all part of what it meant to be a missionary. One other story from St. Herman is that he was once uh, eavesdropping on, Saint, on, on Father Macari and the martyr Juvenali, whom we'll talk about in just a few moments. Those two were sitting around a fire on the beach arguing over who was the best person to go to the mainland to present the gospel of Christ. And Father Herman in his diary noted that he was listening to the conversation and he wrote down, would that all Orthodox Christians argued about who was the best missionary for Christ. That's a fantastic story that's in his diary. It's also, of course, clear in all of their writings and diaries that they came to America not to make little Russians out of what they describe as the Americans, but to plant orthodoxy in this land so it might thrive and flourish um, and become a fresh vine in this part of the world. That's again, quite beautiful and it's our own foundation. We're gonna go on to the next slide, um, which is Peter the Aleut. Uh, Peter the Aleut, of course, you see his scroll. Uh, I actually commissioned this icon um, and I chose the saying which is reported to be his last words as he was being tortured in California, uh, trying to get him to renounce his Orthodox faith. And he just simply responded, I am an Orthodox Christian and I will not betray my faith. Most likely, Peter was one of the orphans raised by St. Herman. Uh, the record, again, it looks pretty clear that he was what we would call today Shanghai. That meant that while he was in Kodiak, someone knocked him out. Uh, he was awakened on a whaling vessel. Uh, used as slave labor, and then in California, again, part of the, what was then a Russian area for California, uh, he was captured um, by non-Orthodox and was tortured, having his fingers uh, cut off one at a time, his toes, and eventually um, he was split open. If there's not a better patron for our Orthodox teenagers in America, I wouldn't know what it is. 
And again, I hope that, that we can actually illuminate this first martyr uh, amongst our teenagers, tell the story and allow him to become their intercessor as we all seek unity. The next slide, of course, is of Juvenali. The Alaskan tradition is always to pray for Juvenali, to, uh, to pray to Juvenali and his companion. Juvenali, of course, won that debate with Makarios. Makarios went out on the Alaskan chain, which is a thousand miles of uh, island, where he found, as I said earlier, most of the people already had embraced orthodoxy. They just needed to be chrismated. They needed to be married, uh, these sorts of things. Juvenali went to the mainland. There was a mistake in, in a Russian priest's diary that noted that he had been martyred at Lake Iliamna. Lake Ili the people around Lake Iliamna, by the way, always denied this. They said he was our father and we loved him. We would never have done this. But later on, an oral history that was actually to being taken by the Smithsonian in the village of Quinahook, uh, which is a coastal Yupik Eskimo village, uh, there is the story of um, so, uh, someone coming from across the sea being met by the shamans. Then the description, of course, is what we describe. It was clearly an Orthodox priest. The shaman tried to curse him, could not. And the shaman told the native peoples it was because of what he was wearing, which was his cross as a priest. We know that his, uh, his reader was an Athabascan Indian. Um, and so the story is told that they tried to push him back. He kept coming. They fired the arrows at Juvenali. And as the arrows pierced his body, of course, uh, the story goes, it was as if he were swatting flies. And we know what he was doing. He was making the sign of the cross. Yupik Eskimos don't swim. They know because of hypothermia, it doesn't take long to be in the sea and you're dead. Uh, but Athabascans who are from the interior do swim. Uh, and they described his companion as jumping into the sea and swimming like a seal. They went out with their kayaks uh, and speared him to death. So our Orthodox faith on North American soil is built on the blood of martyrs. And here are three that I just presented. Next slide. St. Innocent uh, of Alaska, uh, his, his secular name was John Binyaminov. Um, he actually was born John Popov, and he changed his surname to Binyaminov uh, because he so admired one of his professors. Uh, he was at the top of his class, uh, very bright, and he was approached about going to serve as a missionary in Alaska, and he was like, uh, there's no way that's going to happen. So uh, he thought that his uh, uh, wife would be the one who would just simply say, no, John, that's not happening. He was shocked that his wife said, what a great idea. We need to go as a family, as missionaries to Alaska. He had one more card to play, and that was his mother-in-law who lived with him, and he was sure she wouldn't want to go. He was wrong. She blessed it and said, we're off to Alaska. So he, of course, was an amazing person in so many ways, a great linguist. He learned Fox Aleut and began translating scripture and, and liturgy prayers into that language. When he eventually was in sit, modern day Sitka, he even mastered the Tlingit language. He was a master clock builder. The clock in the cathedral in Sitka, if you ever go there, uh, is his own. If you go to Sitka today, there's still the Russian bishop's house, which he lived in. It's no longer under the church, but under the auspices of the uh, um, parks, the state parks department. They're generous with us. I've actually been blessed serving in his chapel with his chalice, his censer, all of these things. But it was very moving for me to sit in the room, which was the first American seminary. And in that room, uh, which you can visit, uh, you can feel the sense of, of prayer that's there. St. Innocent said, in order for orthodoxy to grow in North America, we had to do three things. We had to recruit men for the priesthood locally. We needed to train them in local seminaries, not send them abroad. And we needed to learn how to teach and preach in the language that people understand. Now, I think in a modern context, that's not just simply linguistically, but that's through all of the social media and everything else. But those are three very solid foundations to achieve unity here in America that St. Innocent gives us. He was eventually widowed, went back, received monastic tonsure, and was given the monastic name Innocent. So it took another 40 years from the time that um, uh, Yosef was sent back 
as the Archmandrite who accompanied the first missionaries, he never, he was consecrated Bishop of Kodiak. He never set ashore. And to this day, it's believed that the boat was sabotaged because we all know you can't grow the church without bishops. So the first bishop was apparently intentionally drowned at sea. It took another 40 years before St. Innocent returned as the bishop. And what a remarkable story. He eventually would become the Metropolitan of Moscow. Uh, he underwent uh, some of the earliest cataract uh, removal surgeries. They didn't go well. He was quite blind. Uh, but he founded the first mission, Orthodox Missionary Society. And to, again, read what he was writing in his time is incredible. Because he said that we Orthodox Christians should stop depending upon governments, kings and czars and others to fund our missionary work. We need to reach into our own pockets and fund missionary work. That's part of being an Orthodox Christian. So that's another foundation. We'll go to the next slide, watching the time. Eventually, uh, St. Tikhon, who would um, actually be consecrated a bishop uh, with a little canonical wink at age 32, he became Bishop of Piscoff. Again, very bright. Um, uh, student of his own of his own uh, generation, uh, early selection for consecration to episcopacy. He was eventually then moved to North America. I have a personal great devotion to Saint Tikhon because his attitude was one that I've actually never seen in any record of any bishop since then. And what I mean is, he had the title of Archbishop of America, and by golly, he believed that. He saw all of North America as his flock not just Orthodox people or Russian people or whatever. All of the Orthodox were part of the one household of faith and all of these other people were part of his missionary turf. The way that he related particularly to people from an Anglican tradition uh, is simply quite remarkable. Uh, and I can't go into it all of it now, but it's a good read uh, if you'd like to study this further. But for our point today, this is something that's so significant. I want you to read the farewell sermon of St. Tikhon at some time before Christmas. Um, it's a sermon that he preached on the Sunday of Orthodoxy after he was being recalled to go back to Russia where he would be elected patriarch in the middle of the Bolshevik revolution and would eventually be martyred. Um, and uh, that's a story all of itself. Um, but what's important here is his vision for the unity of the church in America. At that point, there was one canonical um, oversight for everybody here in America, and he was in charge. So his, his vision was to minister to the different ethnic groups, there would be bishops consecrated from those traditions. The first of those we'll look at in a moment was an Arab, um, St. Raphael Halloweeny. Uh, Halloweeny was, of course, uh, Syrian. There's an incredible story of when his mother was pregnant with him that his parish priest was going from housetop to housetop during um, the slaughter of Christians by radical Islam. Uh, Joseph of Damascus, who's now a saint, by the way, uh, giving communion uh, to the people uh, as they began to flee. St. Raphael, of course, when we get to him, there's a great phrase, which he said that he was an Arab by birth, a Greek by education because he was educated at Halki. He was a Russian in spirit. He actually taught uh, at the Kazan Academy and he was an American by choice. Uh, and that's a remarkable thing. But St. Tikhon chose him uh, to be the bishop to oversee the Arab speaking Orthodox. He had in mind uh, the now relatively new saint, Sebastian Dabovich, uh, to oversee the Serbs. There were also plans for Greeks, Romanians, other ethnic groups. The problem is that he was recalled back to Russia and with the Bolshevik revolution, kind of like Humpty Dumpty, everything shattered. Everybody was reaching back to the different homelands and traditions uh, because nobody was trusting the communist Bolshevik revolution in Russia. So that's again, it's foundational for us. I like to tell my Russian friends, you all have overcome the impact of the Bolshevik revolution in America, we're still dealing with our shattered state and divisions. Next. 
Francisca Olga uh, Michaels. She is not yet a glorified saint, although she is in process. I think that this is a saint that God is revealing to us that's just for our time. If there's anything that's, that's impacting orthodoxy, it is the sort of out of control pan-orthodoxy, sorry, pan-sexuality that's impacting our culture. This is a woman who, with the testimony of so many, she was um, uh, the wife of a priest, she was a midwife, delivered babies, but so many women who have been abused by rape, uh, domestic violence, uh, women who have been mourning post-abortion impact, have been visited by Matushka Olga. We have their testimonies. It's an incredible witness miracles being attributed to her, healings being attributed to her. And it does seem that God is revealing to us a woman saint uh, who is there for us in a time when so many are suffering from the impacts, as I said, of this kind of explosion of pansexuality and abuse in our own culture. Next slide. So this is the last slide. It's kind of a synaxis of North American saints. This is really quite incomplete. Uh, and it's not that we just recognize we have saints who are known and unknown to us, uh, but God is continuing to reel to us uh, saints that are most likely in the process will eventually be formally glorified through processes in the Orthodox Church. So I'm going to stop there, uh, and we can open up for Q&A in the time we have remaining. Okay, is there anyone who would like to be unmuted and has a question for Father Chad? I'm just looking here. Just put it in the Q&A if you do have anything to ask or comment. Okay. Charles Agelat asks, some say St. Peter's story is not correct. Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, Charles, um, there are always naysayers. Uh, and I would say that all we have to do is look at the beauty and impact of, uh, of what we see when, when there is this devotion to Peter the Aleut. Um, almost everything holy, there is a negative factor. And today, of course, living in the age of the internet where there's no accountability, there's all kinds of stuff that's being put out there. Okay, Nancy Desmond asks, any more information on Matushka Olga's coming glorification? Great question. I just happened to have had a Zoom with uh, the husband of her granddaughter, who is Matushka Olga. She bears her grandmother's name this past Tuesday. And I actually asked him where we are in the process. And uh, they're still collecting uh, testimonies uh, from witnesses and uh, stories of miracles attributed to her, of which there are in abundance. Uh, unfortunately, Archbishop David uh, of Alaska is quite ill. We're all in need of, he's in need of our prayers. Um, but it, the, the process is going forward. Uh, and there are actually icons, again, from what I have been taught, it's incorrect to actually put the, the, uh, the halo on her, uh, but there are icons out there where they already have that. So what we're seeing is much local increase in devotion uh, within the Alaskan tradition. And again, that's an important part of moving forward with the former glorification. Thank you, Father. Bill Suval asks, what is the process for sainthood? Who nominates them and who confirms them? That's very interesting. You know, if you look at the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they've been breaking their own rules lately. You know, they're, they're supposed to be dead at least 50 years before they start the beatification process, but they seem to have discovered a fast track. Um, our tradition is not nearly so formalized as in Rome. Uh, ours really does begin with local devotion. Uh, and as the church sees this witness and begins to experience and record uh, miracles attributed to these various saints and the stories, 
Um, it will then go, it needs to go to an autocephalous church. So in this country, it goes to the Orthodox Church in America. They're set up for that process. And for instance, when St. Raphael Hawarini uh, was glorified a few years ago, that ended up being a joint effort uh, with, between the OCA and the Antiochian Archdiocese locally, uh, because the Patriarchate abroad uh, would not take up the cause. Uh, so that was done beautifully, jointly, uh, between the OCA and the Antiochians. Very good. Uh, we don't have any more questions at this point. Um, I would just like to ask you, Father, if there's a, a couple minutes left for you. Um, sure. So, oh, wait, uh, Bill's asking now, are there others in the process for canonization? Uh, no. To my knowledge, this is, this, this is the, only, the only one that's in, in, a, in a formal process here in America. Yes. So from your time, especially in Alaska, do you have... Uh, which of the saints is, is do you feel closest to of these that you spoke about? That's a very interesting question. And I hope by answering, I don't offend, I'm not you know, offending any of the other saints because I need all their prayers. But I said when we sh I showed you the slide of St. Tikhon, I have a particular devotion to him, uh, largely because I do come from an Anglican background. Uh, my family, my wife's family are multi-generational Anglican in our heritage, although we're four generations Orthodox now. Um, and I can explain that if that confuses you. But uh, my first time visiting Moscow, I, I, was, I was really determined I was going to venerate the relics of St. Tikhon. And uh, they were very kind to me, and they actually opened the church where his relics are uh, before it was open to the public. But the problem was I didn't have access to a candle. And I was really kind of anxious that I, I at least wanted to light a candle as I was venerating his holy relics. And I couldn't get one. And so in my sort of perturbed state, uh, I began to think, well, you know, if he wants me to light that candle, we'll find one. And sure enough, uh, I just happened to look down and in one of the cracks, in the stone floor, there was a beeswax candle. Um, so I took that as a, as a sign, dug it out of there and lit it. Uh, I've since had the pleasure several times of, of uh, returning to venerate those relics. Um, so I feel particularly close to him. Well, thanks for sharing that uh, personal story, Father. Um, we don't have any other questions um, here, and uh, I know you, you're waiting to get on to another meeting. So we thank you so much for, for uh, presenting these American saints to us and in such a personal way. Well, thank you for the invitation. Again, I'm sorry we're kind of moving quickly through this, but I think you've, you've got a good flavor for what is in fact our American heritage, and that dovetails beautifully with the vision of OCL. So we'll ask their intercession on our work that we can in fact get to the vision of St. Tikhon of one church serving all of the faithful here in North America. Thank you very much, Father Chad.